So once again, graduation Sunday. And let's be honest, graduation, kind of a funny season, right? You got the advice thing going on, but you've also got the graduation speeches. Uh, and it seems like every time I go to graduation, at least, there's a certain sense that the, the speakers there are going, okay, I've got a captive audience for 20 minutes. They have to listen to me. There's no way, they, they can't go anywhere. They have to, they want to say goodbye to people and they want to, you know, show that they were there. So they've got this captive audience that they want to share, like, all their wisdom and all the things that are stored up in their mind. And so they, you know, go on and on and they, uh, you know, they just, they, they use that time. Uh, the funny thing to me about graduation speeches is a lot of times people don't end up actually saying anything of their own. Uh, it's all like quotes and like stuff from other people, which is all well and good, uh, but it, it's usually not necessarily their material. Although once in a while, you do find uh, a very original graduation speech. Uh, one time I went to a cousin's graduation at University of Redlands, probably the best graduation speech I've ever heard. It was actually uh, the creator of Cheers, uh, the television show, if, if, you, uh, if you've seen that show. Uh, sometimes you want to go, where everybody knows your name. And uh, the, there was two creators, and they were going back and forth. And it was truly like one of those times I'm like, man, this is a really good graduation speech. Now, I don't remember anything they said during gradu- that speech. Because if we're really honest, nobody really remembers anything that's said during graduation speeches. Uh, or most sermons, for that matter. But, you know, <laughs> that's another thing. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, I want to I jump quickly into, into five life lessons uh, that I think we can glean uh, from the life of Jacob. Uh, now, as a bit of warning, uh, these are a little bit unconventional, but not necessarily uh, lessons that you would normally hear during a graduation speech or during a sermon. Uh, but despite what it may seem, I think these may actually indeed for us be good news. Um, and uh, best of all, I didn't come up with them. So here we go. Uh, number one, life is hard. Life is hard. Now, I think we'd all be willing to admit this to a certain extent. And how many of our mistakes, how much trouble do we get ourselves in trying to make life easy on ourselves? Okay, husbands, be honest. How many times have you guys gotten in trouble with your wives for trying to take some sort of shortcut? Okay, or kids to your parents, or you know, we, we just get in ourselves in so much trouble when we try to, to make things easy on ourselves. For example, uh, when Annie and I first moved down, we had some friends over for a party. I don't remember what sort of party it was, but I do remember there being ice cream and cake. And one of our friends had a, you know, one of those little cake plates, and he was eating it. And he was walking along, and he dropped a little bit of ice cream on the floor. And he didn't realize that anybody was watching him, so he kind of looked at the plate, looked at the ground, just went, <laughs> rubbed it in with his foot. Now, what little he know, Annie's sitting there watching him. And uh, not, not really something you want to do when she's watching you. And so he was like, oh. And you know, he's like, I could get a napkin. She's like, it's a little late for that one, my friend. <laughs> But, you know, like, I've done way worse stuff than that, let's be honest. Um, when Annie and I lived up in Menlo Park, she had a uh, Toyota Celica. It was a, like a 2000 or something like that. And one day she let me borrow it to go to the grocery store. And I had pulled into the Safeway parking lot. And there was a shopping cart in the way. Always a shopping cart in the way, right? There's always something in the space that you want. And so rather than put the car in park get out of the car, go move the shopping cart, pull into the space. I'm like, I'm just going to move the shopping cart with the car. <laughs> Great idea, trust me. And so I proceed to uh, try to, to, to nudge and then to push the shopping cart out of the way. But what I didn't realize is that the shopping cart had, had bumped up against one of those curbs. You know, the, the curbs are in the front of the spots. So I pretty, put a pretty good dent um, in Annie's car. Now, that's bad enough. But then when she asked me about it a couple weeks later, I'm like, I don't know. No idea how that happened. Maybe it was a troll. I don't know. I, so we make a lot of mistakes in life trying to make things easy on ourselves. And I think Jacob, kind of a prime example of this. Jacob was one that time and time again, and especially near kind of the, 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 the initial glimpses of his life that we get, it was a guy that was always trying to make things easy on himself. Like, so if you want to flip over to, to Genesis 25... Um, kind of starts the story of Jacob. Now, you know, the the story of Jacob spans several chapters in Genesis, but there's certain pieces and there's certain chunks that if you've been around the church for a while may may be more familiar and may jump out to you a little bit more. So uh, Genesis 25 tells the story of the birth of Jacob and Esau. They're kind of wrestling around in the womb, and uh, Esau comes out first, and Jacob comes out grabbing onto Esau's heel, kind of this 
foreshadowing, if you will, of what their relationship's going to be like. And then it tells a story or it kind of gives a glimpse into what sort of family dynamics are going on. That Esau was his dad's favorite. Jacob was his mom's favorite. Let me tell you right now, not real healthy family dynamics. You know, that, that's setting up for some drama right there. And then it goes into the story about how Jacob steals his brother's birthright. Apparently birthright was something that, that Esau was able to give away. And so uh, Jacob is there at home cooking, uh, making some tasty stew. Jacob comes in, I'm sorry, Esau comes in from the fields, is super, super hungry, famished, you know, on the point of death, he says. And his brother says, I will give you some of this as long as you give me your birthright. You know, so again, trying to make it easy on himself, steals his brother's birthright. And so in the chapter 25 of Genesis ends with um, verse 34, which says, Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. So already there's kind of this tension. There's this, you know, there's, there's something going on here. But then even more kind of profound and even more dubious is, when, is a couple chapters later in chapter 27 when Jacob steals his brother's blessing. Now this, isn't, this was straight out deception. This wasn't like, you know, just kind of craftiness. This was straight out deception with the help of his mom. A little bit weird. Uh, but if you've heard the story before, you know that um, Isaac says to his oldest son Esau, hey, go Go hunting, bring back some food so that I can give you my blessing. The mom, Rebecca, says, hey, Jacob, we've got a, perfect, a prime opportunity here. Go ahead and uh, get me some goats. Bring them in. I'll make up, you know, this meal. And Jacob starts to put it together and goes, in, uh, in, in verse 11 and 12, he starts to go, wait a minute. Like, what's going on here? He says, Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him, tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. So Jacob realizes that something's going on. He knows this is, this is a little bit suspect, a little bit, a little bit shady. And yet he continues to go along with it. Um, if you know the story, you know that, that Jacob is successful, that, that Isaac blesses him, and then Esau comes in right after, and Isaac's like, wait a minute, who was that that I just blessed then? And, and, and you get to the end, or near the end of, of 41, or I'm sorry, of... Uh, chapter 27 and verse 41. And it says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. You know, we've all probably been in the, in the situation in families where, you know, something happens, especially with a sibling for some reason. You're like, dude, I'm going to kill him. You know, like there's just something that happens. And yet this is probably a little bit more profound. This is probably a little bit more um, legitimate um, in terms of what Esau says about his brother Jacob. Now, I think it would probably be a little bit healthier, actually a lot healthier, if we were to realize from the, from the outset that life is hard, that we're all marked for suffering, we're all, all marked for hard times. Nobody really gets out of it, gets out of life without it. Ash Wednesday this year, I was sitting up in the balcony over in here, in this section here, and I was thinking about a couple of different families that, that sorry, uh, that I'm associated, that I know, kind of through a couple different circumstances. One was uh, a family that, that Annie was connected to, who on the night of Valentine's Day uh, put their 10-month-old daughter to bed, and she didn't wake up in the morning. And so I was thinking about her, and then I looked down into this section here, and there was a family here um, who had lost a son a couple years ago, a son who actually we would be celebrating today as a graduate. And I'm like, man, these people know suffering. They know that life is hard. There's no, there's, they, they, there's no way that they can get around that. And we, you may not have lost a child. You may not have gone through something like that. And yet, we, we've all have stuff in our lives that we need to mourn and that we need to grieve. Life is hard. We must be signed with the cross or else we will spend our lives trying to avoid it, trying to get away from it. This life is not primarily about our happiness. It's not about feeling good and not about doing that sort of stuff. And it's due in part to our next point, that you're not that important. You're not that important. Yeah, it's good news. I I promise. It's good news. (laughs) Now, I think in life, we all want to make a name for ourselves, right? We all want to to kind of have something significant in our life. We all want to do these great things. I was talking with some high school students about a month ago, two months ago maybe, and we were talking about this concept, and and one of my students said, "Um, yeah, I, I, I want at some point, some suffering high school student to have to read my name in a history book and remember who I was 
you know, and I'm like, awesome, thanks, man, that's brilliant. But, the, you know, I think we all kind of feel that, so we all want to be remembered, we all want to be great, but, you know, when we, when we really think about how many Einsteins do you know? And I'm not talking about the sarcastic, oh, nice move, Einstein, like that sort of sense. But truly, honestly, not, rem- not many of us will rem- be remembered in the history books. Not, mem- not many of us are going to go down as people that will be remembered. A lot of people, we're, our names will be forgotten. We, nobody's going to remember who we are. And that's one of those reasons that everybody loved Cheers, right? It's because it was a place that you could go where everybody knew your name. Um, four to eight-year-olds were asked about love. You know, describe love or what, what's love about, what's, what's love like. One of them said, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. Now, it sounds kind of maybe like a little bit of a corny graduation quote, uh, but I think there's also something to it. We, we want to know that, that there are people there that, that love us and that our name is safe with. Um, when I was trying to make a decision about five years ago, almost exactly five years ago in August, well, actually, no, it was five years ago, probably last month, um, I was, I was, at the time, Annie and I were in Menlo Park, working there in student ministries. Um, I had an offer to come here to Solana Beach, and I also had an offer to uh, work with my buddy Joe out in Atlanta. Um, and I'm very much one of those people that takes things very seriously and kind of stresses about things and feels a lot of times like the whole world is on my shoulders. I don't know if you like that at all, but that's definitely my personality. So as I was trying to consider these three different options, I'm like, man, what if I make the wrong decision? Well, you know, what if I totally screw up everything? This is going to be awful. And my buddy Joe, one of the people that, w- that I was, you know, considering taking a job from, he looks at me and he says, Stu, you're not that important. <laughs> Honestly, that's what he said to me. Which was a really good reminder for me. It's, it's actually good news. Because a lot of times we feel like we have to prove ourselves. We feel like we have to, to, to prove that we're important. And we are infinitely important to God. We're infinitely important to God. And yet, to the world and to the history books... Probably not so much. We're probably not going to be remembered in the history books. People are going to forget who we are. But the great thing about this fact is that God's plan is bigger than us. It's bigger than our mistakes. So Jacob steals Esau's birthright. He steals his blessing. Esau says, I'm going to kill him. Puts Jacob on the run. Jacob takes off. Goes, man, I got, I got to get out of here for a while. So he's running running away from, from the problems that he's created by trying to make le- life easy on himself, running away from his brother. And one night, he gets tired, he sets up camp, lays down, has this kind of really profound dream. Jacob, it's the, the, the scene of Jacob's ladder. There's a ladder and angels are coming up and down and, and God essentially repeats to Jacob the promise or the covenant that he's made with Jacob's ancestors, with his forefathers. Jacob wakes up in the morning. He says, when Jacob, uh, verse 16 of chapter 28, says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. How often do we find ourselves in a, in a situation where, whether through our, our mistakes or the mistakes of others, we're like, man, there's no way that God is here. Yet something happens, something occurs, where we go, man, God is here. Our awareness changes. The thing, we become aware of the way in which God is, is with us and God is for us. So, life is hard. You're not that important. And this is reflected in an even bigger blow to our ego than the fact that we're not that important. And that's, you're not in control. You're not in control. And this, I think, is probably one of the most difficultly, like one of the most profoundly difficult things for us to accept. We spend our entire lives trying to control outcomes, trying to make things go the way that we want them to. Now, uh, these up here are my boys. A little picture of my boys here. Uh, Isaac there on the left uh, will be three in August. Ryder will be 18 months, a year and a half, uh, on the 18th, so just in a few days here. And in in case you've, you've not had kids or in case you've forgotten, Kids are the most profound and fundamental challenge to the idea that you're in control that you'll ever meet. <laughs> Especially three-year-olds, for some reason. Um, you, you even have any hint of control. You, you think you're in control. These sweet little things will throw that idea straight in your face. It's true. 
So for example, uh, I've, I've heard that you always teach what you need to learn. You teach what you need to learn. And so last night, uh, at about midnight, when, when Isaac was up screaming, uh, and I realized that we didn't have any more Motrin, and I had to go to CVS. I have to get dressed, get to the car, go across, come back. You know, I'm just frustrated. I'm like, ah, I've got a sermon to do tomorrow, and <laughs> I don't have time to be dealing with kids. And, you know, and I hear in, in my voice, because I've, you know, I've been working on this thing for a while, so I hear, life is hard. You're not in control. You know, you're not that important. And so I respond to that still small voice in the way that I normally do in those sorts of situations. Oh, shut up! I don't want to hear that right now. But, the, you know, we're not in control. I mean, it's just a simple fact of the matter. Um, and for us, our kids have been a profound example of that, and especially our son Isaac. Um, you can't really see it in the picture much anymore, but um, about 20 weeks into Annie's pregnancy with Isaac, we found out that Isaac would be born with a cleft lip. And as a parent, you, you don't necessarily, I mean, you have expectations, but they're probably not um, conscious until something challenges those expectations. And so from a very early time in, our, in Annie's pregnancy with Isaac, we realized, man, we're, we're simply not in control of this thing. We wouldn't have asked for Isaac's cleft necessarily. Um, and yet it's been a very profound blessing in our life. Uh, something that we've learned from, something that we are grateful for. We, we want him to be a, a man of character. And suffering can often produce that sort of character. Um, Isaac was also born with microtia on one ear, meaning this ear, uh, meaning that uh, one ear kind of looks like it never fully opened up. And as a result, he has what are called stenotic ear canals, so he has hearing issues. Um, and right now, he's, not, he's, he's almost three. So, and those things don't bother him. He doesn't really know. He doesn't really care. And we, Annie and I, care, carry that burden for him. We, we know that at some point, someone's going to make fun of him. Just, it's kids. I mean, that's what they do, right? Um, and, but someone's going to make fun of him for his cleft, or he's got a little red scar there, or from his ear, or the fact that he wears a hearing aid, or something along those lines. And at that point, the burden that we carry for him will be placed directly on him. And it will double our burden, because we will carry his burden as well. And that kills me to think about. You don't want your kids to suffer. You don't want your kids to have heavy burdens. And yet, when I think about what happens with kids who always get what they want, those kids are rotten people, right? You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't want one of those kids. Forget that. So our hope and our, and our, and our prayer for Isaac is that this, the, his cleft and his hearing issues and, and all the other things that he goes through will be chances and opportunities for, for character and for redemption. As Jacob kind of, kind of progresses, um, he makes a decision to, 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 to rejoin with his brother and to meet his brother again. And the night before this happens, the night before he is to meet his brother, he wrestles with God. You find this kind of really interesting story, this really interesting episode in Jacob's life. So he's left all alone. Chapter 32, verse 23, says, He sends all his family across. And then in 24 it says, um, so Jacob was left alone. He's alone. He's, not, he's, he's there by himself. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And that hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and human beings and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But then he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob, even in this wrestling, wrestling a healthy thing in a relationship with God, asking questions, expressing doubts. But Jacob's still, at the end of it, it's like, man, tell me your name. Like, I want to retain kind of some control. I want to, I want to, to kind of have some control. Yeah, he goes, no, you're not in control. Verse 31, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. We cannot pin God down. It's just one of those fundamental theological lessons. And sometimes as we wrestle with God, as we interact with God, God touches us 
in a way that causes us to lip. A reminder that we're not in control. And a reminder that there's something beyond us. And maybe you limp because of, a, because of control and because of a lack of control, because of the way that God has touched your life. Maybe that limp is not a curse. Maybe that limp is a blessing. The continual realization that we're not in control prepares us kind of for the ultimate example of this. Number four, you are going to die. It's good news, I promise. And this is the ultimate. This is the ultimate in lack of control and in lack of importance. Someday you are going to die. Now, for certain things, there are people that have said it better than someone else can. So I want you to watch a uh, a video clip here of one of the most profound 21st century theologians, Bill Murray. Yeah. Are you afraid of death? Yeah. Me too. And there's no way out of it. You're going to die. I'm going to die. It's going to happen. And what difference does it make if it's tomorrow or 80 years, much sooner in your case. (laughs) Do you know how fast time goes? I was six, like yesterday. Me too. I'm going to die. You are going to die. What else is there to be afraid of? Paul? I. I'm going to die. You are going to die. That's just the way it works. It's the way it happens. And yet this realization of our own mortality and the the finitude of our life uh, can put our lives into proper perspective, can help us prioritize and help us make decisions about what's really important. In the story of Jacob, you see that the, the reason that he decides to make Reparations are to make amends with his brothers that he's afraid. He knows that his, life is, that his life is threatened, that his life may come to an end. And it drives him back to God and back to his brother. In chapter 32, right before he wrestles with God, you see him kind of on the, this, right before he meets up with Esau. And you see him pray in 32 9. It says, Then Jacob prayed, O God, my father Abraham, God, my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you said to me, go back to your country and and relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have come become two camps. Now this is the part, this is the, the realization, this is the mortality. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. I'm afraid. Jacob comes to a point where he's like, man, I, this may mean my life. I am afraid. I'm going to die. And yet, this is something that, that needs to be taken care of. This is something that I want to handle. The cool thing about this realization, and the thing that's significant to me, is that we are going to die, and yet that's not how the story ends. I was sitting in the, when I was sitting in the balcony on Ash Wednesday, I was just, I was like, man, this is a rough story. I know how this story ends. I know how it ends for all of us. We all die. I mean, this is, that's, that's how the story ends. And then I said, you know what? No, that's not how the story ends. The story, all great stories, especially the Easter story, ends with resurrection. It doesn't end with death. It ends with resurrection. And that can help us realize and live into our final point, that your life is not about you. Your life is not about you. Now, to be totally honest, I wouldn't entirely agree with this statement, nor with Rick Warren's statement that he starts out 40 days of purpose not about you. I wouldn't entirely agree with that. I, I would agree with kind of a qualified version to say it's not entirely about you, 
And yet, God has given you gifts and abilities. God has given you and, and blessed you, and God cares deeply, deeply, infinitely about you as an individual. And yet, God also cares about all the other individuals as well. So God cares deeply about you. So it is about you on some level, but it's not just about you. God invites us into something infinitely more important, infinitely deeper. God saves us from our small selves and invites us into something deeper. The Jews of of Jesus' day had gotten kind of a a narrowed view of what the world was about and what the Messiah was going to be about. Um, And they had begun to think that, that God was only there to bless the Jews, that that was his primary purpose, that was his primary goal. And yet, Jesus came to to communicate that God is doing something new. And everybody is invited. Everybody, Jesus, time and time again, inviting people into into what he was doing, that the Jews thought, there's no way they're invited. There's no way they can be a part of what God's doing. And yet, Jesus continually and perpetually invited people in that had no business and no place being there other than the fact that God invited them in. In Genesis 33, you see Jacob's life begin to take on a a meaning and a a significance beyond just his life. It's when he meets up with Esau. So he's got this fear, this trembling, and he goes to meet his brother. And and he's walking towards him. He uh, went ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Kind of a sign of submission. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau ran to his brother as the prodigal, prodigal's father runs to his son. When our lives become about something other than just ourselves, it can be a healing and a redemptive influence and a healing and redemptive force in the world that our lives can become something about someone other than ourselves. And this is a great thing indeed. I want to end this morning with a quote. I know it's customary to do three points in a poem. I'm doing five points in a quote, but you know. <laughs> it's, one of the, uh, it's from the, one of the best book slash movie series of all time, Lord of the Rings. And it's uh, after the cal- Council of Elrond, Elrond the, the chief elf. Um, they're, they're talking about what to do with the Ring of Power. If you've never read the books before, this is kind of this hinge, linchpin sort of point in the books and in the movies, in the plot. What are we going to do with this ring? There's one ring that, will, that has this tremendous amount of power, and they've decided that they have to destroy it, that that's the only thing they can do. And Elrond says this, The road must be trod, but it will be very hard, and neither strength nor wisdom will carry us far upon it. This quest may be attempted by the weak with as much hope as the strong. Yet such is oft the course of deeds that move the wheels of the world. Small hands hands do them because they must, while the eyes of the great are elsewhere. Father, sometimes the road that we travel is full of darkness, full of trial, full of suffering. That life is hard. We are not in control. We are going to die. And yet, we ask that you would give us your grace to sustain us, to remake us, to take that suffering and to make it something that redeems a part of your creation. And that we would find our own redemption in that as well. That you would bring us together as a community and that as we experience your love and your peace and your grace, that that would flow out and seep into the lives of people around us and that would draw us to one another and draw us to community. We thank you for these lessons. We thank you for limitations. We thank you for the ways in which you have given us what we need and that you continue to sustain us. We thank you for this morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.